I'm Professor Frank Joseph, uh, and I'm a consultant endocrinologist, uh, and I practice out of Spire Liverpool Hospital in Liverpool and Spire Murrayfield Hospital on the Wirral, and my NHS base is the Countess of Chester Hospital in Chester. So polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS as it's more commonly known, uh, definitely causes a degree of infertility. Studies show that about 40% of women with polycystic ovary syndrome can struggle with infertility. Why this happens is, is a whole combination of things. Firstly, we know that there are hormonal changes that occur where you get a, an imbalance between the male to female hormone ratios within women with PCOS. There's also a change and effect in terms of insulin levels uh, in the body, as well as impacts from a combination of these things on the pituitary hormone. So that pituitary gland being the gland that controls a number of different organs within the body, especially in women, it does control the ovaries. And because of these imbalance in hormones, what tends to happen is that there is uh, the non-formation of the egg or what we call ovulation, uh, which doesn't happen at the right time. So women with PCOS have as a result, what we call anovulatory cycles or menstrual cycles that do not produce an egg when they're supposed to. In addition to this, women with PCOS have irregular periods and the periods commonly, it tends to be less frequent periods in some cases, it can be absence of periods for months on end, but it can also go the other way. And this is a uh, odd thing because the majority of people tend to have less frequent periods, but you can have more frequent periods, heavier periods also as part of the presentation. So yes, infertility definitely affects women with PCOS and it is a key reason why women with PCOS seek help. Whilst a number of women come seeking help because of infertility uh, at a time when uh, you know the woman and their partner are trying to have children this tends to be the tip of the iceberg and it tends to be a much further downstream problem for these women so women that i see often have struggled for years on end from as early as their teenage years when they start to struggle with the symptoms and features of polycystic ovary syndrome. And people don't pay enough attention to these because these effects tend to have such a huge physical as well as psychological impact on uh, young women. So things like acne, things like hair growth in the wrong places such as the face or around the chest and nipples, or around the umbilical core, umbilical area. All of these uh, do a lot of damage for, for a woman's uh, confidence, for their uh, psychological well being. In addition to the mental health impacts that these have, we know that once you start to see features of PCOS, such as these, there's also a tendency for these women to put on weight. And what we also know is that women with PCOS who tend to put on weight have a much higher risk of developing things like diabetes in pregnancy, and then later on developing type 2 diabetes at an earlier stage than one would expect. They also have a higher risk of developing high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So yes, there are definitive features that affect young women even before they get to their stage in life where they're looking at having a family or starting a family. And some of those can be dealt with much earlier on with appropriate strategies to try and help them have a more preventative, proactive ap approach to their health. Uh, and it does a world of good for their long-term mental and physical well-being. So that's a really interesting question. Uh, I often joke about this to patients and I say to them, you know, if you go to a gynecologist, a gynecologist will investigate you with an ultrasound scan and look for cysts on your ovaries. And if they find the cyst, then they say you have polycystic ovary syndrome. Now, endocrinologists, on the other hand, don't tend to even bother looking at doing an ultrasound and looking for these cysts on the ovaries because they tend to look at the individual patient 
and try and identify with those patients the various features that we know can manifest themselves that come together to make that diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome. And that's the key word, syndrome. A syndrome is a combination of features that you put together that then gives you a diagnosis. And those diagnoses can be made with, uh, you know, there are a lot of different criteria and guidelines out there that try and define the syndrome. But the common things that we would consider include irregular periods. We would look at hyperandrogenism. So that's ex excess kind of male hormone balance where you end up either biochemically measuring excess male hormone or you see clinical features of excess male hormone in the woman, which would include hair growth in the face or chin or in places where they don't want it. And also acne is another example of excess male hormone imbalance. Uh, and I think the irregular periods, those male hormone features, combined with the cyst that you see on a scan, help us to make that diagnosis. But not having one or the other doesn't set, mean that you don't have the condition. And you've got to keep an open mind to try and help these women with the strategies that you can to, to help their health and well-being. Uh, absolutely. So this is often now the reason why a lot of women come seeking health, care and input, because a lot of these features of acne and hair growth in the wrong places are considered cosmetic and not considered a marker of what can be longer term health issues. And those health issues are longer term physical health issues, as well as the mental health impacts that, you know, thinking about your skin and how you present yourself to peers or friends or colleagues might uh, be interpreted. And, and I think a lot of women are very conscious about this. And there are things we can do to help them, uh, you know, with appro appropriate medical therapy uh, to try and prevent, reverse and improve those features. Uh, so yes, it is becoming a more and more understood uh, presentation. And women are willing to ask more proactively for help and support, which is the key uh, to helping these people early on. What we know about PCOS is that most people traditionally will associate PCOS with a tendency to put on weight and a tendency to not be able to lose weight easily. And so, People often stereotype women with PCOS as saying that they have to be overweight. But actually, if you look at the studies and the trial data, it's only 60 to 80% of women we think have PCOS, have obesity or are overweight. So we do have a significant proportion of women who have got polycystic ovary syndrome, but are not overweight or obese and actually are of a, what we call slim phenotype. Uh, and the slim phenotype has similar clinical features in terms of excess hair growth, acne, irregular periods, cysts on the ovaries. Um, and, and that's because you can have the, the underlying condition, which is called insulin resistance. Whilst we traditionally would see insulin resistance as a condition we associate with overweight or obesity, you can get insulin resistance even if you are of a normal weight or as we call it, the slim phenotype of polycystic ovary syndrome. So the answer to that is it's not entirely dependent just on someone's BMI. 